Hello everyone, my name is Kishan and I'm here to talk about pharmacovigilance audit planning on a global scale with a special emphasis on enhancing efficiency for new and existing markets via something that is very near and dear to me, risk-based approach. So my promise to you is that in next 15 minutes, I'll give you my take on why and how we should use risk-based approach in efficient planning of pharmacovigilance audits and especially for the companies that are expanding in new and emerging markets. So when we talk about pharmacovigilance audit planning, Three levels come to mind that are also dictated by regulations, strategic, tactical, and operational. As you may already know, strategic level planning is the planning for a few years, mostly five years. Tactical level audit planning is the planning for a given year. And operational level audit planning is the planning of the individual audit at hand. So in the context of this presentation, we are not talking about operational planning because I believe that the operational level audit planning can be done based on the need of the hour, However, strategic and tactical level audit planning, so the planning for five years or a few years and the planning for a given year, determine whom we audit, with what frequency and with what priority. So when I refer to PV audit planning in this presentation, I mean strategic and tactical. Now, before we take off, let's get the ground clearance by establishing why PV audits are necessary in the first place, you know, just in case anybody has any doubts in their mind. So PV audits are performed because we want to ensure quality and compliance in PV and PV related activities. And thereby, of course, we want to protect public health. But our practice of performing PV audit might also have something to do with the fact that it's a regulatory requirement. And as they say, the worst kind of trouble is the legal trouble. So we definitely want to avoid that. All right. So now that we have received the ground clearance by establishing the prime two reasons as to why we need to perform PV audits, let's ponder why should we seek efficient planning for performing PV audits? Well, in response, let's consider a quote said by someone centuries ago, give me a lever and a place to stand and I will move the earth. Who said that? Archimedes. These days you tend to hear a similar quote and it goes by something like this, give me an unnaturally long year and unlimited resources and I will audit every entity. Who says that mostly? Well, every QA team. Can we achieve both? We cannot. Why? Because it's not pragmatic. We don't need to, and also we cannot, audit all of our audit targets with a similar rigor and similar frequency, such as annually. So there has to be a way to prioritize our audit targets. Also, there is another reason why we should seek efficient planning for PV audits, and it is the increasing expansion of pharma companies in new and emerging markets. What is happening these days is that the companies are asking themselves, hey, can we open an office over here and expand? If the answer is yes, they tend to tell themselves, what are we waiting for? With almost the same ferocity as uh, Judge Judy over here. For some reason, if they realize that they cannot expand in some territory on their own, they tend to find a buddy or a friend or business partner, of course. So in those situations, companies tend to ask their potential business partner, hey, can you sell my drug? Or can I sell your drug? Or can we both sell this drug? If any of the answers is yes, the next thing that they tend to tell themselves is let's do this and expand. So what does this result in? Well, this results in increased revenue. Of course, you don't say. But apart from that, this also results in more number of affiliates, partners, service providers, and often with complex relationship to audit than ever before. And that is why efficient planning of PV audit program becomes a high priority. All right, let's also consider what efficient planning means in context of PV audit. Well, in context of PV audits, efficient planning means determination of audit priority based on risk. This is the philosophy of looking first where it hurts or may hurt the most. Among people who are listening to me, many will have multiple kids and they would resonate with what I'm talking about. So not all of your kids require the same level of oversight or supervision. Some kids would be fine without much supervision and intervention, whereas some kids would require checking in from time to time. Basically, it is the same approach with your audit targets. What we need to do is to turn into Walter White, AKA Heisenberg from Breaking Bad, if you've seen that show, and we need to show up on the doorsteps of our risk factors, eliminate them, take care of them, and tell them, hey, I'm the one who knocks before they get a chance to show up on your doorstep trying to trouble you. All right, so now that we have considered what risk-based approach means in a nutshell, let's consider the definition from GBP module four. So according to the module, the risk-based approach is the technique of determining areas of risk, where risk is probability of something bad happening, 
the severity of it, and the likelihood of its non-detection. So let's get into the crux of this presentation. We have two common methods on our hand, FMEA and PICS, by which we can apply a risk-based approach to PV audit planning. We are first going to talk about the philosophy behind these two, and then we will run a practical example through both of the methods to get a more actionable idea. So what we are essentially doing by applying risk-based approach through FMEA or PICS method or any other method that we are going to cover is to find out the risk associated with each audit target. Once you have a list of audit targets and the risk rank or risk score associated with all of them, you can then easily prioritize who need to be audited first. All right, before we apply any of the methods for risk-based approach and PV audit planning, what we need to do is to have an ingredient. That ingredient is the set of criteria for each audit target. So your business partners would have a set of criteria against which they can be evaluated. Your affiliates can have a set of criteria for, against which they can be evaluated. And the same goes for your service providers. Where do they come from? Well, there are generic criteria that can be applicable to all of these audit targets that are given in GVP module four. Some of the other criteria you can brainstorm or you can sort out based on how your quality management system, how your PV process are set up. But it goes without saying that you need a set of criteria for each kind of audit target that you have in your organization. And then you can begin to apply any of the methods that you choose for risk-based approach. And then comes out the risk score or risk rank. All right, so I know we have reviewed the flow, but it is difficult to visualize how the process would look at this point. But bear with me, we're going to consider a specific example and run it through both the methods and find out how we can actually get risk score or risk rank. Let's touch upon the philosophies of both the methods one by one. First, FMEA. Its principle is very simple. According to it, risk priority number or risk score, if you will, is the combination or multiplication of three different values, severity of failure, likelihood of frequency of failure, and non-detectability of the failure. So here is the equation. Risk priority number is equal to value for severity into value for likelihood or frequency into value for non-detectability. Each of these value is in the range of one to 10. So higher the number, higher would be severity or likelihood of frequency and non-detectability. When you multiply these, you can draw the line for the score where it will be high, medium and low. So if the total score is less than 50, it would be considered low, the risk would be overall low. If it's 50 to 250, we can conclude that the risk priority number is medium or the risk is medium. And if it's higher than 250, the risk is generally considered to be high. All right, so let's touch upon the basic philosophy of PICS method or the method that was propagated by Pharmaceutical Inspection Cooperation Scheme. According to it, the risk is thought to be made up of intrinsic risk and compliance related risk. Intrinsic risk can be also categorized in two components, complexity and criticality. So here is how the actual estimation is done. You have intrinsic risk score on the left hand side and it is made up of criticality and complexity. So you have to derive criticality and complexity value. They are in the range of one to three. But when you have both, you can put together in this table and derive the intrinsic risk score. In parallel, you have to also derive compliance related risk score and determine if it is high, medium or low. When you have the overall value for intrinsic risk score plus the compliance related risk score, you put them together in this table on the right hand side and you get the final risk score. All right, so it is at this point that I can say, hold my coffee. This is going to get interesting. We are going to consider an example of a fictitious business partner X and try to determine its risk through both the methods. So before I show you the next slide, I need to ask you for a promise. Promise me that you wouldn't try to read all of the content on the next slide, but you will rather focus on what I'm saying. Done? Okay, let's go ahead. So if you remember, we had said that we need an ingredient to put into risk-based approach method whether it is FMEA or PICS, and then we are going to get final risk score or risk rank for that particular audit target. And that ingredient was a set of criteria. So since we are talking about a fictitious business partner X, and we are trying to determine the risk score or risk rank of that partner, we first have to determine a set of criteria applicable to all of our business partners. So I've put together a list of 22 criteria or questions. Some of them come from GVP module four. These are general criteria for any kind of audit target and others I have inserted based on 
the fictitious business partner management process or oversight that we have in our company. So not to read through all of the criteria in detail, but let's at least look at some of these. So 22 at the bottom says PBA in place. So the answer would be either yes or no. 21 says time since last inspection. So maybe the partner was recently inspected by a regulatory authority and maybe it was not. 20 says KPI or quality plan or quality oversight. So whether we have some sort of daily oversight, day-to-day -day oversight on their operations or not, uh, that would have a response. Uh, 19 says time since last audit and 18 says finding in previous audits. So when we audited the partner, whether it was recently or it's been some time, and whether there were significant findings or number of findings in that audit or whether there was just a few finding or no finding in that audit so all of these questions these 10 and 22 questions will have a response and those are the ones that we need to input into the method to get to the final risk score so now that we have 22 criteria for all of our business partners so we will have to assume hypothetical responses to each of these criteria all right so let's do that. But remember the promise, do not try to read through every single thing in the next slide, because if you do, you'll lose my attention and I will get very, very insecure because I do get insecure when I lose somebody's attention. OK, let's go ahead. So here are the responses to our 22 criteria for our fictitious business partner X. Now that we have the responses for our fictitious business partner X for all of these 22 criteria, the time is to actually use FMEA and PICS both the methods and get the final risk score or risk rank for our business partner. So let's start with FMEA. FMEA said that the risk priority number or risk score was made up of the multiplication of the values for severity, likelihood and non-detectability. Okay. So we now have to divide the 22 criteria across these components of severity, likelihood and non-detectability where they fit. So this means that there are 22 criteria in total, but we need to divide these 22 criteria across these three categories according to where they fit in the concept. So some criteria indicate the concept of severity, some would fit under likelihood and some would indicate non-detectability. For an example, if you look at the 10th criteria under severity, number of products so if the number of product is higher the potential failure would be more severe similarly let's look at the eighth criteria under likelihood finding in previous audit so if the number of findings in previous audit was higher it is likely that the next audit will also uncover a number of findings let's look at non-detectability it has criteria such as time since last audit time since last inspection so you can say that if the partner wasn't really audited or wasn't inspected in recent past some of the issues may have been swept under the rug and they have gone non-detected so it increases the factor of non-detectability so this is what we have to do once we have disseminated the 22 criteria across these three categories where they conceptually belong, the next thing we need to do is to assign values for possible answers for each of this criteria. So for an example, 10th criteria under severity, again, number of products. If the partner has more than five products, the value we can assign would be 10. If the partner has less than five products with us, it is slightly less severe comparatively if there's a failure, so the value would be fine. And again, of course, these values would be subjectively determined for your company so you have flexibility in there but as long as you assign the values and you also distribute these criteria across these three categories consistently for all of the business partners or all of the audit targets it wouldn't make a difference now findings in previous audit under likelihood if there were more than two audit findings in the previous audit we can say that the value could be 10 if there were one to two findings while you could be five and if there were no findings the value could be one similarly non-detectability time since last audit let's say it was uh, more than three years ago the value could be 10 two to three years while you could be five and less than two years while you could be one now what we need to do next is to insert the responses that we had hypothetically assumed for each of the criteria for our business partner x and calculate the score and of course i'm talking about these hypothetical responses in the third column that we had assumed for our fictitious business partner x and when you evaluate each of the response for our fictitious business partner x against each of the criteria and the possible values that it can have under it you will start to get the score for each of this criteria for our business partner so considering the similar example 10th criteria number of products the response from our partner was that they have four products with us so the score of course is five as per the post possible values similarly findings under the previous audit the response from the partner was that they had three findings in the previous audit that we did for them and hence the score would be 10 
time since last inspection. The partner's response was uh, that they were inspected four years ago and hence the score for that criteria is 10. So once you have the individual score for each of the criteria based on the response from the partner, you can then add them up and derive the average for each of the component. The average for severity would be 7.5, the average for likelihood would be 5.25, and the average for non-detectability would be 8.75. And those three values are what we needed to derive the risk priority number based on FMEA. So let's put the values or the averages in the equation, and the answer is 344. And if you look at our scale that we had, it is higher than 250 and we can derive that this partner has a sufficiently high risk priority number or risk score. In other words, this partner as an audit target falls in the high risk category. All right, so we obtain the risk score or risk rank of our fictitious business smarter X as for the FMEA method. Now is the time to put to test PICS method. If you remember, as per the PICS method, the risk is composed of intrinsic risk and compliance related risk and intrinsic risk was further divided into complexity and criticality. So let's derive intrinsic risk, then we will derive compliance related risk, and then to get the final risk score, we'll put them both together. So if you remember in FMEA, we had distributed 22 criteria across three categories, severity, likelihood or frequency, and non-detectability. We would take the same approach over here. Out of the 22 criteria, those criteria that point towards complexity of the process and inherent risk because of that would be put under complexity. So those are the seven criteria on the left. Out of 22 criteria, those criteria that point towards criticality of the process and inherent risk because of that would be put under criticality. Those are the nine criteria on the right. Now granted that there might be some subjectivity at the time of distribution of these criteria across categories, someone would think, okay, this means complexity. No, this means criticality. But as I was saying earlier, as long as you use the distribution of the criteria and the criteria themselves consistently for that type of audit target, meaning all of our business partners, it would not generate any problem. So the other thing that we have to do after distribution of criteria and complexity and criticality is to assign values for possible answers under each criteria like we had done in FME. So that's what the third column values indicate for both complexity and criticality. So now that we have the distribution of criteria under complexity and criticality, and we have also defined the values for each possible answer under each criteria, all we have to do is to put the responses that we had hypothetically assumed for our fictitious business partner X. And of course, I'm referring to these 22 criteria and the hypothetical answers in the third column that we had already had. So as you can see on this slide, as you start to insert the responses for our fictitious business partner X for each of the criteria, you will see the individual score. Then all you have to do is to take the average for both complexity and criticality. For complexity, the average is 2.14. We can round it off to two since the table only allows full integers. For the criticality, it is 2.2. And again, it would be rounded off to two. When you have both, you can put both of them in the table where they intersect is your intrinsic risk which is medium in this case. So we now have intrinsic risk score, which is medium, but we also had another component compliance related risk score to calculate, and then we can put them together and get the final risk score. Okay, so we have distributed seven criteria under complexity, nine criteria under criticality, and the rest of the criteria actually nicely fit under compliance related risk. So those are six criteria on the left hand side. The next thing that we had to do was to define the values for each possible answer under the criteria. We have that in column three. And on the right side, you will see that when you insert those responses that we already had for our fictitious business partner X, we will get the score for each of the criteria under compliance related risk. And now we can take the average for compliance related risk score. In this case, it is 2.66, which can be rounded off to three. And three, of course, indicates that there is high compliance related risk for this business partner. So now that we found out that the intrinsic risk made up of complexity and criticality was medium and compliance related risk was high for this particular partner, we can combine both and get the final risk score as per PICS method. Okay, so now we have risk score as per both the methods for our fictitious business partner X. In FMEA, the score was 344, which was not the highest possible, which is 1000, but it was still good enough to be called high risk. And over here in PICS, the risk score is six, which is still high enough, although not the highest, which could be nine. But both the risk scores through both the methods are quite comparable. All right, so here is the last slide that expresses my final thoughts. First of all, application of risk-based approach and PV audit planning is crucial. Secondly, 
the application of risk-based approach enjoys some flexibility. Whether you use one method or the other or a combination of both is up to you. Next, the agreement between the two methods that we used over here, FMEA and PICS, that requires some significant exploration in PV. And finally, the organization should conduct adequate exercises based on the criteria that they have for evaluating each type of audit target, business partners, vendors, affiliates, systems, to determine which of the method would be suitable for applying risk-based approach to PV audit planning. As long as they use a documented approach and a consistent set of criteria, PV audit planning would be smooth and of course compliant with the regulations. So with that, I would like to thank you for hearing me out on this topic. Your time and attention are definitely worth a salute. So here you go.